let me introduce myself. My name is Steve, one of the pastors here at Citadel Square. Good morning. Uh, if you got a Bible, why don't you go ahead and grab it. If you don't, uh, there will be one in the pew rack in front of you. And go ahead, flip it open to the middle of your Bible. We're going to take a look here this morning at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Let me tell you where we've been. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and chapter 4 have been Solomon's reflections on a variety of world philosophies. Solomon sought out uh, pleasure in hedonism, in work, and wine, and women, and concubines, and he said at the end of that search, it's all vanity. Uh, it's all a striving after wind. And then Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon looked at the variability of life. There's a time and a season for all of these differences, and though God has put eternity in the heart of mankind, Man can't figure out what God has done from the beginning to the end. We just get 70, maybe 80 years to be a part of what God is doing on the planet, but we can't uh, delve into the eternal mind of God to understand his plan from beginning to end. And then we looked at uh, things that really cause us some consternation. Solomon looked at life where uh, under the sun, in the place where there ought to be righteousness, there ought to be justice, there was just wickedness. And it made him frustrated. Then we looked at oppression last week. And Solomon looked out at life and said, men don't love each other the way they're supposed to. That there's oppression. We, we take each other for granted. That, that men and women in our eyes become objects by which we can advance our career, advance our agenda. And now at the end of that philosophical searching, as Solomon explores this worldview of life under the sun, Solomon, uh, to put it plainly, is going to go to church. So this text, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, is going to come on the heels of an individual who is searching for meaning, who is recognizing the variability of life and understanding that life under the sun is crooked and broken, like he said in chapter 2, that uh, what is lacking cannot be counted. What is crooked can't be made straight. And uh, with a heavy sigh of relief, you think Solomon is going to go to church and have all of these things find resolve or be resolved. They're all going to find resolution. Uh, and what you're going to see in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians, wrong book, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 here is uh, Solomon's experience of being the king in a time in Israel's history where uh, Solomon was the one who built the temple, if you don't know that. Solomon is the son of David, King David. King David establishes uh, the rule and reign over the north and the south. It's Israel's high point as God's people. And then Solomon inherits a kingdom where all of the war is done and he has massive uh, success and popularity and peace and wealth and riches and he builds God a house. And what Solomon is going to do today is look at that experience of individuals coming into the house of God. And by the end of the text here today, he's going to leave us with counsel that is essentially this, fear God. Now, if you've read the Proverbs before, you know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. It's the starting point in our relationship with God. It's the starting point in us being able to live lives under the sun wisely, that we're able to synthesize information and morality and sin and righteousness and put it together into a life that is wise. But if you were to ask somebody, what does it mean to fear the Lord? What does it mean for a church to fear the Lord. What does it mean for a church to be reverent? Now, you may have all sorts of things that come to your mind in terms of uh, what it means to be irreverent. We could probably agree on that list. But what does it mean to be reverent? For us to fear the Lord. What are the things that we would be doing together as a church if we were reverent? Is it the songs we sing? Do the songs make us reverent? Is it the way we dress when we arrive at church? Does that necessarily uh, display a reverent attitude towards God? Maybe we're reverent because we're in the line of people who have come before us, that we now worship and sing and preach in a building that's 167 plus years old. Does that make us reverent? Does that make us cognizant and to live our lives in light of God and who he is and what he says? 
Well, that question is what Solomon is going to illustrate here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, only he's going to do it through the negative. He's kind of, you know, he's like a cynical guy. So he, this text is not all that encouraging. You've got to invert it to understand what it means to fear God. And what Solomon is going to do is all through this text is show you what it means to go to church foolishly. Solomon is going to say a lot of fools go to church. I didn't say it, Solomon did. A lot of people approach God as fools. And he's going to lay out about four different things about what it means to enter into the presence of God in a foolish way. And that what we're going to do is draw some principles out of this. I think that uh, by the end will be really encouraging to you. Is that it's really encouraging to me. This is a text that's really um, weighty. Uh, because Solomon is taking the spiritual element of our lives. We all come in here this morning with certain experiences, certain uh, disappointments, certain hopes and dreams that we're praying in our relationship with God. And one of the things that I know that when I get up to preach, I'm coming up into the pulpit to pray that God's word might hit us in our hearts, me as well, in the areas of life where maybe I'm fearful or discouraged or uncertain, and I'm longing that God would speak to his church. And for us to hear what God would say means that we need to approach his word with a sense of reverence. And this text is going to show you how to do it. You with me? All right, let's pray. And then we'll ask God for his grace here. Father in heaven, for these few minutes that we gather here, like orphans around the fire, looking into your word to hear some truth that might orient our hearts, that might soothe the areas of our lives where we are discouraged or fearful or uncertain about what you're doing in this particular season. We pray for your spirit. We pray for grace. We are confident that as we come to your word that you speak to us, that in your word we have the mind of God, the infinite and eternal living God, the creator of heaven and earth. So for these few minutes, might we gather, might we open our ears to hear what you would say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Y'all there? Here's how he starts. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Watch yourself when you go into the house of God. Now, if you have a cross-reference there, if you have a Bible with cross-references, you may have uh, Exodus chapter 3. Do you have that? You have Exodus chapter 3? Keep your finger there in Ecclesiastes. Turn back to Exodus 3. You may know what happens in, in Exodus chapter 3. But I want to show you this here just as we get started to give you an idea of where Solomon is going with this text. Back the second book of your Bible, all the way to the left, Exodus chapter 3. You see the heading there? 3 verse 1 is the burning bush. Look at what it says. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Verse 5. Then he said, don't come near. Now that's an interesting thing for God to say, isn't it? Somebody waves you down on the street, calls out your name two times. Hey, over here. Don't come closer. Isn't that odd? It's odd of God for, to flag down Moses with a miraculous sight of the angel of the Lord in a burning bush and then for God to stop and to say, now don't come any closer. I've got your attention but don't move any closer because, look at the remainder of the verse. Don't come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Now come back to Ecclesiastes. There's principles 
in that Exodus 3 passage. There's the holiness of God. There's the invitation of God to somebody who, if you've read Exodus chapter 1 and chapter 2, is a murderer. In Exodus chapter 1 and chapter 2, Moses tries to bring about justice by himself. And he kills an Egyptian and he flees for his life and he runs to the backside of the wilderness and he's there for 40 years until God gets his attention. So there's the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the invitation of God to who? To sinners. But then there's this stiff arm from God. God says, don't come any closer. Take your shoes off because where you're standing is holy ground. And then Moses' response is fear and terror because he hears God speaking. Now, Solomon says, guard your steps when you go near to the house of God. There's a bunch of examples in this all the way through both the Old and the New Testament. But this, as Solomon begins, uh, what he is doing is making you aware that when man speaks to God, it's a serious thing. It's a sobering thing. And Solomon says, watch your steps when you deal with God. See, we live in a time where a relationship with God is somewhat flippant. We live in a time of a lot of comedy and a lot of uh, flippancy and a lot of lack of sobriety, especially when it comes to our spiritual lives. And there's a consistent approach to God and who he is that we really don't need to take God seriously. That God is not that just, he's not that holy, he's not that serious, he's not that different from us. But the thing that Solomon recognizes, who at his point in his career and in the historical arc of the nation of Israel, there are priests and there are Levites and there's a temple and there's a most holy place and there's a holy place and there's the bronze laver where you would wash and there's the altar of atonement and there are all of these layers between God's people and God himself. And the only way that you can approach is through a very prescribed kind of way. And the people who fail to approach God in an appropriate way have disastrous consequences. Let me just reference a few. When Moses gets the law in Exodus, God says, set a barrier around the mountain lest too many people try to break through and see God and the wrath of God break out against them and I have to start killing people which is always a hint that we need to be circumspect in our relationship with God. Let nobody touch the mountain, he says. If even an animal touches the mountain, you stone it and you kill it. In Numbers chapter 1, the Levitical priesthood's job is to be God's honor guard. That when the tabernacle is in the midst of God's people, what surrounds the tabernacle are the Levites. And God gives Levites the authority to kill those who try to come near of their own volition. They have the, you know, the license to kill, to use a James Bond reference, which you never thought you'd hear a James Bond reference in connection with numbers, did you? Only here at Citadel Square. You ever heard the story of Nadab and Abihu? There are two priests, two Levitical priests, who actually get the call to come up on the mountain with the elders of Israel. And their job is to burn incense. And it says in Leviticus chapter 10 that they burn unauthorized fire before the Lord. The way you burn incense before the Lord is you take coals from the altar of atonement. The place where sacrifice happened. And it's as if God is saying there's only one way to come and that's through the shed blood of the sacrifice that allows you to come in to my presence and to burn incense which are representative of prayer. And Nadab and Abihu enter in, light the incense themselves, and fire from the Lord breaks out and kills them. There's a king named Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26. You may be even reading 2 Chronicles 26 this week. King Uzziah reigned for 50 plus years, was a good king. Toward the end of his reign, he decides to go into the temple to burn incense. 
He doesn't go through a mediator. He doesn't go through the priesthood. He doesn't go through the Levites. He goes on his own because, hey, after all, I'm a king. I'm in control. I'm in the authority over these people. I can come to God however and whenever I want. And he burns incense and the priests rebuke him and say, it is not for you, O king, to burn incense. And at that moment, leprosy breaks out on his head. They take him out and he's always excluded forever from the uh, presence of the Lord. You get the point? Now, unless you think this is just an Old Testament idea. Acts chapter 5. After the church is started, there are two individuals named Ananias and Sapphira, a husband and wife couple. And everybody in the church is selling stuff and bringing it and laying it at the apostles' feet. And everybody is making sacrificial steps of generosity to care for this new group of people called the church. Ananias and Sapphira sell a piece of property just like their, a friend of theirs in the congregation named Barnabas did. Barnabas brings all the money, lays it at the apostles' feet. Ananias and Sapphira, they sell a piece of property. They come and lay the money at the apostles' feet, but they don't lay all the money at the apostles' feet. And Peter says to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? When the land was yours, wasn't it yours to do with whichever you wish, with whichever you desire? And God strikes him dead. His wife comes in a couple hours later. Peter asks her, hey, did you sell the land for $100? Yeah, it was $100. Did you give $100? Yeah, we gave all the $100. No, you didn't. You gave $80. You're trying to look more generous than you are. The feet of those who carried out your husband will now carry you out and God kills her too. And guess what happens with the church? Great fear falls on the whole church. What's the point? The point is God is to be respected for being God. So for us, when we enter into a relationship with God, when we enter into church, when we enter into coming into the place where we acknowledge God for who he is, it is a reverent and a sober and a serious thing because we're dealing with God. Amen? We're dealing with the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, and it is not a cavalier or a flippant thing that we, when we come to deal with God. From time to time, I get flyers in the mail. You ever get flyers in the mail from people you don't want to send you flyers? Why do they spend all this money on this marketing campaign of something I throw away immediately? And often, I will get flyers from churches, and churches will make this pitch that I ought to come to their church. I don't go to any other churches. I only go to one church. This is the only church I go to. I have no idea what other churches in the city are doing. But churches like to market because that's, I guess that's what they do. We don't market. Do we, do we mail out anything? I don't even think we mail anything. We don't even own stamps. <laughs> so what, we, what I get in the mail from these churches from time to time is that I ought to come to their church. And not one time have I ever had a flyer show up in my mailbox that quotes Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1 that says, don't come to our church. Don't draw near to God. Guard your steps if you're going to come into a relationship with God. If you're going to come and worship the living God, the maker of heaven and earth. Don't do it. Take it more seriously. What do the flyers typically say? We've got a kid's area. we got a pool. Everybody gets a PlayStation. We just built a new sanctuary. Right? It's all of these perks. And the house of God in Solomon's time was such a serious and such a reverent thing that Solomon recognizes, watch your steps when you start to deal with God. Now that's how we come. Let's look at why we come. Look at the remainder of the verse there. Here's what he says. Uh, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near which is what we're doing. We're talking about every Old Testament Jew would understand. When I draw near, I am coming into dealing with the God who is here, the God who is real, the God who has real things to say and real opinions and perspectives and real truth and real holiness and real justice to draw near to what? Starts with L. Listen. To draw near to listen is better. Now, we've talked about this better phrase throughout the last two chapters, that two are better than one, that wisdom is better than foolishness, right? Now, here's this proverb again at the end of verse one. To draw near to listen is to better is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. So the question is, why are you coming? 
One talks about how you come, respectfully, soberly, circumspect about who I am and what I am getting ready to do when I draw near to worship God. But second, it has to do with the intent of your heart. See, you can draw near quiet. You ever have, anybody have children? And you get on a parenting rant and you can tell at some point in about two minutes into the parenting rant that's gonna go about 10 minutes that you've lost them. That they're quiet, but they ain't listening, right? They're aware that conversation is happening and that words are washing over them of great wisdom and insight. But they have this look that you can tell the lights are on, nobody is home. And you feel good because you get to the end of the 10-minute rant and what did you accomplish? You don't know, but you feel better and they don't walk away and do the very same thing. That's parenting. And Solomon recognizes to draw near to God means that we have a desire. We have an ambition. There's a longing in our hearts when we come near to God that God is the one who ought to be doing the speaking. To draw near to listen and to open our ears rather than open our mouth is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Now, the sacrifice of fools is not some hidden place in like Leviticus somewhere that you haven't read about. It's probably here that there's a way of sacrificing. This is very, very common for the, the people of Israel. They understood all of the rules and regulations uh, on the sacrifices that they ought to bring. But here, the picture that Solomon is going to paint for us is that there's a way to offer sacrifice to God foolishly. There's a way to enter into this presence of God reality and to not take seriously what I'm doing and for me to end up being a fool. Now, here's the first mark of it. You see what it is? The first mark of a foolish sacrifice is that they don't know that they're doing evil. That fools, when it comes to a relationship with God, have no idea where they stand with God. They have no idea whether or not they're in right standing with God or poor standing with God. So probably there are individuals here who come into the presence of God and do it because, well, it's what we do. Well, other people are doing it. Well, we've always done it as a family. We always go to church. Are we reverent when we go? I don't know, but that's what we do on Sundays. We always go. We always dress up. We always do the thing. We always show up and we always sit quietly and we always do what we're supposed to do. But there's no awareness as to whether or not their life is pleasing to God. There's no awareness that they might be off with the God of the universe. Would you agree that what God thinks of our relationship is more important than what I think of my relationship with God? You with me? That it's way more important for God to go, we're good, than for me to go, we're good, right God? I had a college roommate who said, me and God have this thing. That I just, you know... Uh, he had to bury, this is my roommate, he had to bury his dad. He went through some real kind of difficult suffering things. But he ended up saying that uh, me and God are good because I say we're good. It's like he had the equation of God and man and he had all the man side of things. And he said, me and God, we've got this agreement. And the agreement wasn't, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The agreement had nothing to do with God's justice, God's holiness, God's righteousness, the depravity of mankind, the need for a savior, for somebody to atone for his sins. He just presumed that my life is good with God because, hey, I go on Christmas, I go on Easter, I try to do good things, I don't murder anybody, I don't even take pens from work. I'm a pretty good guy. Fools do not know that they're doing evil. So let's look at what this fool's sacrifice is. Look at verse two. Be not rash with your mouth. That's a great word. It's used throughout the Old Testament and and it means, it's kind of translated a variety of ways. It's uh, it's used of the witch of Endor when she calls up Samuel and she goes, oh gosh, this worked. Samuel's here. And it says she's terrified that what she does worked. Sometimes it's translated dismayed or afraid, alarmed, bewildered. Uh, it's used only, only uh, in two places in Ecclesiastes. Over in Ecclesiastes 7, here's what it says. It's translated quick. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says this. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. 
So what's a foolish sacrifice look like? Here comes this sacrifice of fools. We don't watch ourselves. We take no awareness in terms of where we are in relationship with God. We have no idea whether or not we're doing what is right or what is wrong. Number three, we come in and we're ready to talk. I've got some things that I need to get off my chest with God. Nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. So the sacrifice of a fool comes to their relationship with God with a whole lot to say and very little to hear. That the relationship of a fool to God comes into his presence thoughtless and reckless and ready to speak with no governor on their mouth, no governor on the thoughts of their hearts. That there's this sort of mental vomit that happens in their relationship with God, where they don't consider what they're saying or why they're saying it, whether or not what they're saying is right or whether it's wrong. They're hasty, they're reckless, their heart is blabbering, their mouth is blabbering. Why not? For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Now we've referenced God a couple of times in the book of Ecclesiastes thus far where God has put eternity in the hearts of men, yet men cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. God has done this so men may, if you remember, fear him. That men may come to a point of closing their mouth and recognizing that there are some things that God isn't going to tell me. And it's foolish and reckless for me to demand that God explain himself to me. You remember how Job closes his book? God starts asking him questions that are just dumb questions. He goes, do you know where I keep the snow? Were you there when I created the earth in the morning and the sons of God sang for joy? Can you put a hook in the mouth of Leviathan? Can you walk him around like he's on a leash? Let your little girls play with him? Do you know where the mountain goats give birth? And by the end of the story, Job says, I heard of you with the hearing of my ears, but now I see you with my eyes, and I lay my hand over my mouth, and I repent in dust and ashes. Job recognizes by the end of his experience of suffering and difficulty that God does not have to explain himself to you. Psalm 115 says this, our God is in the heavens. He does what he pleases. Is that frustrating to you? Be honest. That God does not have to explain to you how God runs the universe. And what Solomon recognizes is that it's the fool who boldly strides into God's presence, running his mouth off, letting his heart go unchecked, talking and talking and talking and talking. And Solomon says, hey, God's up there, you're down here. Let your words be what? Few. You respect God for who he is. You recognize that God is God and you are not. Verse three, he goes on. Here's your, uh, he gives you a, a, pair, a little bit of a proverb here to, show, to explain to you what this fool looks like. Verse three, for a dream comes with much business. You ever have a lot on your mind and have weird dreams where you're fighting Batman? Yeah, one guy in the back. You fight Batman too? Amen. You get stressed out, life starts getting pressure, and you start going to work with Batman. I get it. Remember Ecclesiastes 2, with his work comes much vexation, and in the heart, uh, in, in the night, his heart does not rest. Literally, his heart doesn't lie down. What's happening when you're stressed? Because of overwork and you're thinking and, and anxious and muttering and contemplating and planning and organizing and trying to make alternative plans in case those plans don't work out. You go to bed and your life now gets compressed and all the anxiety and the thoughts and the feelings and desires and fears gets compressed into really weird dreams. And Solomon says this is what happened. You don't rest well when you're burdened with overwork and stress and anxiety and fear and despair and discouragement and all these things that come with life, or as a dream comes with much business, much work, a fool's voice with many words. So not only is the fool unaware of how they come to God, 
They're ignorant as to whether or not they're living a life pleasing to God. They're hasty with their words. They're reckless with their mouth. And here, Solomon says, their mouth is just like a bad dream. See, dreams for us aren't reality. Agreed? You with me? Put that together. They aren't reality. They're the expression of all of our anxiety. And they paint a picture in the dream world of things that are not substantial. They're not consistent. You can't rely upon them. They have, for lack of a better term, nothing to do with reality. Now connect it for me. What about the fool's words? They have nothing to do with reality. They're as insubstantial as a bad dream. Now, You've got all this talk, all of this first half of it is talking and approaching God. You with me so far? We're looking at this fool who recklessly comes into God's presence. Now, the fool not only is going to recklessly come into God's presence, but you're going to continue this theme of running their mouth in their relationship with God. And they're about to uh, write a check that their body can't cash. Look at verse 4. When you vow a vow to God, don't delay in paying it. What's a fool do? He delays in paying it. uh, Vows are votive offerings, are not mandatory offerings. Vows are voluntary offerings. That God, I promise if you answer this prayer, I will do X, Y, and Z. God, if you give me the Lamborghini, I will sell it and give the money to the poor. I don't know if that's accurate, God, if that's going to work. But if you do that for me, here's what I will do. I will, in a sense, align my life with answered prayer. Isn't that good? Isn't that what we want? That God, would you come through in this situation? Would you be God and do things that only God can do? And God, I promise I will reorient my life to your answer prayer. Isn't that great? What a great reality that this individual comes into the presence of God, praying and asking and planning and desiring for God to be a part of what is happening in their life. But then God says, don't delay in paying it. Don't make big promises and then not quite get around to obeying and doing the things that I said I would do. When you vow a vow to God, don't delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. Do what you say. This this text right here, this verse is the one that kind of put its hooks in my heart this week. Because this, I don't know, you know, I think every Christian deals with this struggle in prayer that we feel like kind of this looming guilt and uncertainty about whether or not we're praying enough or praying accurately, that a lot of our prayers feel like they're, they're misinformed. A lot of our prayers come out of pain or come out of discouragement, come out of uncertainty. We don't know what God is doing, and our prayers, God has a way of just kind of squeezing out of us. And in this text right here really started to mess with me because I recognized in my own life and in my own heart kind of, I don't know, another way to say it other than kind of a lack of courage. Where I've recognized recognized this through years of my life that a lot of times I'll pray up to a point, but I won't pray to the point where I put myself on the line. And that makes me sad in my relationship with God. It makes me sad that my heart many times is too safe, that I rely too much on my own human wisdom and ingenuity and insight and the Bible verses I know, rather than dealing with God the way this individual does in Ecclesiastes 5, as a person. Do you see that? Do you see how personal God is in this passage? That he's actually an individual that, uh, that can take no pleasure in where you are in your life. He's actually a God who has an opinion on how your relationship and his relationship is working right now. He, he recognizes that there are ways that we disrespect him. There are ways in which we treat him not as holy as he deserves. Too flippantly, 
that we don't take him that seriously. And I recognize this in myself as I read this, that there's this little bit of me that I want to keep God at a distance. I really don't want God to answer prayer and me obey because then it makes my faith too real. You with me? I get too nervous because now my life actually has to be oriented to God answering prayers than than me just kind of pushing God away and going, I'll do my stuff down here if you'll just give me success and fulfillment and the things I want. There's a great example of this in 1 Samuel chapter one. You remember the, the woman Hannah? Hannah is barren. She's married to a guy named Elkanah. Hannah goes to the temple and she prays and the priest looks at her and she's praying so hard and muttering with her mouth so much the priest thinks she's drunk. She's so committed and overwhelmed in asking God to give her a son and she promises to God, God, if you will give me a son, I will make him a Nazarite and I will give him back to you. I promise. What does God do? Who's he give her? Samuel, the single greatest Old Testament prophet there is, the single greatest judge of that generation. Look at verse five. Let me finish that thought before I go on. What would would Hannah have said What would would you say Hannah's relationship with God was like? If she prayed, she asked, she was desperate for God to do something, and then she says, oh, good, I got the son. I'm not really going to give him back. So what's this say about the fool and their relationship with God? They're flaky. They don't follow through on what they say. They make big promises to God, but they don't order their life according to the answered prayer that they have received. And then in verse 5, he says this, it's better you shouldn't vow than you should vow and not pay. Amen? Just don't say anything. What's the fool's problem all through this passage? He can't stop talking. He's running his mouth about God. He's running his mouth about his thoughts and feelings and desires. He's running his mouth about the things that he plans to do for God. He's got big ambitions to serve God. Big ambitions if God comes through for him that he's going to fulfill and he's going to walk in holiness and he's going to be righteous and he's going to do all these things for God. And Solomon says, hey, just stop talking. Verse six, let not your mouth lead you into sin. Hasn't that been the problem? Now at this point, we're not dealing with wisdom and foolishness anymore, are we? You see that? Let your mouth not lead you into what? Sin. We've stepped into the world of morality. We've stepped into transgressing. We've stepped into the world of sin. What is, it, what, what is it called when you say you are going to do something and you don't do it? It's called a lie. What it characterizes a fool's relationship with God? Lies. God, I promise, I will. I'll do better. God, if you only, I will. And they never quite make it all the way to obedience. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. And don't say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Oh, man, I, man, it was desperate. I know, but I didn't. Gosh, I was praying real hard, lots of prayer. But, man, I wasn't that, you know, I was going you know, to totally obey. I mean, I'll kind of obey later. But it was kind of a mistake. I was just desperate. I was just tired. Man, I had bad, you know, pizza last eat. I just didn't, I was over-promising to God, and it really wasn't. The messenger in context is kind of the priest who would hear these people make these vows and then would come to collect and this person would go, well, you know, that's not that, it's not that big a deal. I worked it out another way. Why should God be, what? Angry. Don't make God glorify his justice by destroying the work of your hands. Not, God isn't angry. Look at what it says. Why should God be angry at your deeds? No, why should God be angry at your voice? God, listen to me, God holds you to your word. Do you believe that? That God holds you to what you say. God, I will. God says, all right, let's see. I'll come through, I'll be faithful. You know, one of the major problems in the prophetic literature in your Bible is the fact that God's people were consistent with the sacrifices. 
But their sacrificing to God never worked its way into their morality. It never worked its way into how they treated others. It never worked its way in terms of how they spent their money. They were glad to sacrifice to God, to other idols, to other things, as long as they had success and well-being and prosperity and fulfillment and all of those things. But it never got into their heart. And God's rebuke comes down on people who don't live with integrity. That their spiritual life is merely subjective. And when you look at their life, you go, I don't know, is that person spiritual? Is that person religious? James, remember what James says? Uh, Anyone who thinks he is religious yet does not bridle his what? His tongue, his religion is worthless. What does it mean to be a fool? In the context of Ecclesiastes chapter five, it means for you to say things that you don't mean. For you to promise things to God that you'll never do. For you to pray and to bring sacrifices and to talk a lot and make a big show of where you stand with God. But when you get out of church and you get out of the temple of God, your life doesn't orient around God. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? You are tempting God to destroy the very thing that he promised to give you when you prayed. Verse 7, for when dreams increase and words grow many, there is what? Vanity. Remember what vanity is, a breath. It's there for a short time. It's insubstantial. That's what dreams and that's what the words of a fool are like. But God is the one you must fear. So let's, let's summarize here the life of a fool in their relationship with God. They're reckless in the way that they approach God. They take no stock uh, of their life to consider that they are actually coming before the God of the universe and that he might actually have something to say about where they stand with him. They're ignorant as to whether or not they're doing right or they're doing wrong. They're just uh, approaching God on their own terms and in their own way. They approach not to listen, but to speak, to get some things off their chest, to run their mouth in the presence of God. They overpromise. They underdeliver. They don't orient their life around answered prayers. They don't think that they should live before God with a sense of integrity and purpose and honor because of who he is and what he has done. So let's reverse it. What does it mean for the wise? This is now getting into the heart of what it means for us to live a life of reverence before God. Well then the wise would be aware when they're approaching their spiritual life that God is God and they are not. That he is creator and we are creature. So that that centers you right away, doesn't it? It orients your life, the posture of your heart. Now, as you enter in to listening to God, you are speaking to the expert. Would you agree? That God knows more than you? God has more experience. God has more insight. God has more things to say about how you are to live your life than things that you have, uh, thoughts that you have about how you should live your life. So that the wise now enter into their relationship with God, circumspect, taking stock of who they are and where they are and whether or not they're in right relationship with God. They enter into a relationship with God when their ambition is, God, I want to hear you speak. I'm going to close my mouth and what is going to be more important to me in this moment between you and I, God, are your thoughts, your opinions, your perspectives. God, your thoughts are more important than my feelings, my ambitions, my desires, my discouragement, my, my pain at this point in life for, God, for life not working the way I want it to. God, your perspective is more important than my perspective. And oh God, as I enter into your presence and I pray to you and I ask you, if you let, me, let me ask you this. When you think about the New Testament prayers, do you know how short they are? I mean, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, we could all say it in under a minute. And it is packed with theology. The prayers that Paul prays in Ephesians and 1 Thessalonians are short. You can read them in 30 seconds. 
but they lay hold of the truth of who God is. And when Paul prays and when Jesus prays, he prays in such a way to orient their life around the word of God and what God says. So that when you come across, listen, you don't need to be under this delusion that because you don't pray an hour a day that somehow you're not reverent. You can pray 10 second theologically packed God honoring, God reverenting prayers. You with me? Oh God, because of your purposes and your plan and your sovereignty and your providence, I submit my feelings and my desires on this issue in my life to you. Would you reorient me around your sovereignty and your goodness? That's it. Now, is that prayer packed? It is packed with truth. But the fool enters in and goes, God, I this, and did you see this? And that person said this, and you believe that they cut me off, and I can't believe there's no lettuce, and we've got, gosh, we got a thing with the night, and I'm not going to be there. I don't even like that person. God, what are you doing in this situation in my life? And the wise person goes, God, what do you have to say to me? You want a really frustrating way to make discipleship happen in our church? I know you've been asking for it. You want to advance discipleship and maturity and godliness and holiness and integrity in our church? When you're next to somebody in the midst of whatever life situation is happening and they start talking and they start talking into seven and eight and nine and ten minutes, you want to really frustrate them? Ask them, what do you think God is saying in this moment in your life? Because a lot of times what happens in those conversations is that people do this. You know what I got a problem with with God? I got this situation, and I got no idea what God is doing with it. I'm really frustrated with God because he hasn't come through, and their Bible ain't open. And you, in the kindness of your maturity and your wisdom, because, listen, you all are mature, and you're all going to have the, the opportunity to minister to people who are immature, so you're going to take your Bible, and you're going to be next to him, and you're going to open God's word and go, what does God have to say about that situation? What is the scripture right now that is informing the way that you pray about that situation? What do you think God is trying to teach you in this moment in your life? Because when you do that, you enter in from foolishness to wisdom. You enter into relationship with God where you really believe that what he has to say is more important than what you feel. You with me? All right, it's 11.10. I got only 45 more minutes. Gosh, there's so much here. Let me close with this. In Exodus chapter 20, uh, Moses gets the law. And you may be feeling throughout the course of us looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, there may be this yearning in you and there's this yearning in me as well. That you go, Steve, what about the times where I've been a fool? What about the times where I've run my mouth? What about the times I've lived in my relationship with God with no integrity? And I don't have insight. And I have embarrassed myself because I've promised God things and I haven't followed through on them. Well, then you need to re remember and to recognize what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10. That we can enter boldly into the presence of God. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Christians are never meant to be perfect. They're meant to be honest. We are meant to be able to have conversations with God of authenticity and intimacy and a, a real prayer life. When Jesus teaches us to pray, he says, our what? You're not sure? It's okay. Read Matthew 6 later on. Our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So that because of Jesus, we now enter into a relationship with God as our heavenly father. Where we are accepted, not on the basis of our integrity, but on the basis of his integrity. And in Exodus chapter 20, Moses receives the law. And as Moses is standing there receiving the law, the people tell Moses, Moses, we don't want to hear from God anymore. He's too scary. We can't take it. Moses, would you go up and hear from God for us? And Moses said, okay, I'll do that. Now turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. Later on, God in Deuteronomy says, the people have spoken a wise thing. And he tells Moses, I will raise up a prophet just like you and I'll put my words in his mouth. 
foreshadowing the greater true prophet. That in these last days, Hebrews begins by saying that in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. And the author in Hebrews 12 references that moment on the mountain between, ex, between Moses and the people, between God in flaming fire being revealed, a God of wrath and serious holiness and justice. God saying, come near, but not too close because I'll destroy you. And here in Hebrews chapter 12 is what he says. Hebrews 12, verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. That is what it was like to stand in the presence of God in the Old Testament. It was a fearful thing. But, the author goes on to say this, look at verse 22, you've come to Mount Zion. You have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Amen? This is how we come. This is into the very presence of God, that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What did the blood of Abel cry out for? Justice. What's the blood of Christ cry out for? Forgiveness. Welcome. Bold access into the center, into the presence of, of God. But for a church to be reverent, listen to me now. For a church to be reverent, it's to put into practice the very next verse. Because for us, as a church, we can talk about reverence all day long. We can recognize the, uh, the inconsistency between what we say and what we do. But reverence, all through this passage, has to do with what you do here with this verse. Look at the very next verse. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Do you want intimacy and a relationship with God? Do you want to see God work in your life and answer prayers and reorient discouragement and the idolatries of your life? Then you are going to enter into a relationship with God through the blood alone of Jesus Christ. And he's not asking you to be perfect, but he's asking you to be honest. For you to have intimacy with God in your, uh, for you, imagine this, imagine intimacy with God that now affects my relationship with my spouse, that now affects the relationships with my kids, where my nearness to God and drawing near to him through the blood of Christ causes me to draw near, not to speak and to ramble, but to listen and to ask God, God, would you so reorient my life and my heart according to the truth of your word that I might live a life that is honoring to you? You will not have intimacy and a true relationship with God apart from his work, apart from listening to him who is speaking. So for us as a church, that means we preach the word. That means we counsel the word. That means we disciple our kids in the word. That means we encourage each other with the word, that we lay hold of the truths of God and his word, and we speak them to one another, asking and inviting God to speak into the difficult situations of our life. God, would you show me what you are doing in this season right now? Would you give me a truth from your word that would allow me to cling to it and hold to it? And God, may I live a life that now honors you because of what you have said. That is what it looks like for a church to be reverent. For us to be skeptical of our own thoughts, skeptical of our own feelings, skeptical of the whispers of lies, skeptical of the things that we worship outside of the true and living God, and to cling and to lay hold of God's word. So my prayer for us as a church is Hebrews, 10, Hebrews 12 verse 25, that we don't refuse him who is speaking. Because when you talk more than God talks, you decide that you are refusing to hear him who is speaking. Father, would you make us wise?
Would we take seriously the counsel of Solomon in your word here? Would you orient our lives away from speaking to listening? Would you orient our lives away from reckless speech and hasty hearts and rash words into a place where we long to obey what you say? Father, for those prayers that we pray even this morning, for the things that we are asking you to do. Father, even this week, I pray that you would answer prayers and that we would respond with wisdom, that we would fulfill our vows, that we would try to discern the things that are pleasing to the Lord, that you would make us men and women of integrity, that our external lives and our internal lives might align, that there would be a unity in our spirituality that affects the way we speak and the way we think and the way we encourage and the way we exhort the way we parent, the way we are uh, great husbands and wives and parents and uh, bosses and employees and students. Father, may we be captured by the truth of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.